<clears throat> well, good morning. Morning, good morning. It's good to be with you again. I am so glad to be here. I know Crystal and Lily and Linton are glad to be here last week. Uh, while I was here, Crystal was in Kentucky. Lily and Linton were in Little Rock with my parents. And when Crystal got back, <coughs> he just looked at her and said, Mom, when are we going to Texas? So he, just, he was ready for some consistency to be back, and so especially when you know we went to the to the house we're staying in uh, before the rent truck or rent truck before the moving truck came with all of our furniture, and they're looking around and picking their room, and then thankfully Doug and Tracy watched them while the movers were here unloading everything, and they came in yesterday and just like oh our our toys our furniture, they were just really excited to just to kind of feel like. Some normalcy, and so we are we are glad to be here. Um, before we start, Doug mentioned it, but I do have cards in the back on the little table out there. Take one, take two, three, or four. Um, yeah, if anything comes up during the week, call me, email me. Uh, you know, I want to love on you. And I mentioned it to the the group at the at Park Place on Wednesday that I, I want to hear, and I told them I just want to get to know you guys. I want to hear your story, hear how you came to know Jesus, and I didn't, I don't, I don't know where my mind was last week, but I didn't mention that, but the same is true for for all of you as well. I want to take time just to sit down and, and to get to know each of you, uh, just to to hear where you came from, to hear your stories, uh, and just, just go through life together. And so don't hesitate, if anything comes up, to reach out to me. And so, and with the new year, this morning, I've really been kind of thinking on you know, where do we start? Where do we, how do we kick off 2020? And uh, I just kept coming back to the idea, and yep, we've got the picture on the board of, of laying the foundation. And so what is it, what are some things that, that are really important? And I've come up with an, an eight week series on just some of these foundational issues. And it's gonna be a little bit more topical than I usually preach, I'm normally more of Let's take a passage of scripture, let's look at it, and next week, let's take the next one. Um, and since we're doing that through Luke on Sunday nights, I'm like, well, you know, let me take this opportunity just to kind of kick off the new year, let you as a church get to know what's important to me, and then hopefully we, as a, as a body of faith, can lay the foundation and look at some values that are truly important. And so the first value, probably the most important value, is the value of God's Word. And so this morning, we're going to look at what God's Word is, and then we're going to look at some challenges that our culture and, and things that we face uh, throw at God's Word. So, so let me pray again before we, before we start. <coughs> Father, we do, God, we just come to you now. We thank you for a new year. We thank you for a new morning. God, we thank you for just the opportunity to know you. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I just ask that you will speak through it. Help it to be the foundation upon everything else that we do here at Salem Baptist Church. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so you, you all know about New Year's and New Year's resolutions. And this time of year, every year, people will come up with things that they want to change. Whether it's to be healthier, to lose more weight, to make more money. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on with things that people want to change. They want to make the current year better than any other year before. And resolutions aren't bad, but the sad thing is many of them just don't last. You know, they, you see an influx of people that go out and they join the gym, and, you know, January is the most crowded month of any gym membership ever, and then February comes and it's like, where did all the people go? You know, they're all gone because... You know, life hits us. And it's, again, it's not that making resolutions is bad. It's just some of them don't stick with us. And you probably have heard the song. It came out in 1969. It's a little bit older. But it's in the year 2525 by Zager and Evans. And so, you know, it's kind of a funny take. It's their prophetic vision of what the future uh, is going to look like. And in some ways, some of it's already come true. You know, you can go to Walmart and a computer can check you out. Uh, we went to the McDonald's of Big Spring yesterday, the one by Walmart, and they've got a little machine in there. It's like a big giant iPad you can touch, and it'll take your order for you. Um, and so, but I don't know if we're actually going to ever make it to 25, 25. Um, 
But I know that there's one thing that will never end. There's one thing that will never change. And there's not one thing that's never going to become irrelevant. And that is God's holy and inerrant word. Amen. You know, God's word creates life. We see that in Genesis. In the beginning was God. And he spoke and he created everything. It's what holds life together. Jesus said something that was recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in all three, it's almost identical. In fact, in Mark and Luke, it is the exact same words, the same tense, everything. And in English, all three are identical. Matthew uses a slightly different <laughs> word, tense, but it conveys the exact same meaning. And in English, it reads, Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So in English, we usually don't use double negatives, or you're not supposed to, to be grammatically correct. But Greek, they use the double negative to really reinforce and drive <coughs> home the issue. And here, Jesus is using a double negative just to really make the point that no matter what, everything else that you know, everything else that you see, everything else that you experience, it will come to an end, but my words, God's word, will never pass away. And so as a church of Jesus Christ, our ultimate authority has to be God's word. It's got to be on something that's going to last forever. That it didn't come from humans, it didn't come from me, it didn't come from anyone, but it came directly from God. We have to have our authority on something that has the power to create that has the power to sustain and has the power to save. And so the ultimate authority for Salem Baptist Church has to be God's word. And so turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to jump around quite a bit today. It'd be like an old-fashioned Bible drill. I thought about putting some sticky notes in there so I could get there quick. But I'm like, well, they don't have sticky notes, so we'll, we'll get there together. <coughs> the first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 Paul says this is why we constantly thank God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us you welcomed it not as a human message but as it truly is the word of God which also works effectively in you who believe so above all, we have to accept the Bible. We have to accept Scripture for what it is, that it's the very words of God. You know, while it was physically written down by men, it didn't originate in the mind of any man. The Bible is the only book in the world that doesn't have a human as its author. You know, have you ever thought about that? Of all the books in the world, you used to be able to go, I guess you still can, go to Barnes & Noble or some of these bookstores that actually have a physical place. Now you can go on Amazon and just search and buy almost anything on a Kindle. But every book that's ever been written was written by a human, a man or a woman, except for God's Word. Not even any other religions. They don't claim that. You know, Islam, they, they point to Muhammad as the author of their holy book. You know, all these other world religions, they can point back to some human who who wrote down their sacred writings. But for us, it's we, there's not. While men physically wrote the words on the page, we're going to look that it was carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's inspired by God. And that's what Paul is commending the Thessalonians for. He said, when we came to you, when we shared our message with you, you accepted it not just from us as men or even not as apostles. But you accepted it for what it truly is, that it's God's very word. So Peter also spoke about this concept in 2 Peter chapter 1. If you'll flip even farther towards the back. Second Peter 1, we'll start in verse 16. It says, For we did not follow the cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For he received honor and glory from God the Father, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice when it came from heaven, while we were with him on the holy mountain. We also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And above all, know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so here, Peter is saying that he was one of the few people in all the Bible that got to hear the very voice of God. You know, when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain right before he went to Jerusalem for the last time to be crucified, he took Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain, and, and those three men got a glimpse, just for a moment, of what Jesus' eternal and heavenly glory looked like. Jesus was transfigured, and during that time, a voice comes down from God the Father in heaven, and he says, This is my beloved Son. I am well pleased with him. Listen to him. You know, the, almost the exact same words God the Father used at Jesus' baptism. But Peter said, we, of all people, of all the experiences in the world, we heard the very voice of God. And I know a lot of people, they say, man, if, if I only had an experience like that, then I would believe. If God really just shouted down from a mountain and I heard him with my own physical ears, I would believe. And I would do whatever... He said, but look at what Peter is saying. He says, we, in verse 18, he says, We ourselves heard this voice when it came down from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. And in verse 19, he says, We also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And Peter's saying, yes, I got to hear the very voice of God the Father. But you know what? There's something more sure than that, and that is God's every word that God ever gave us. He says, we have the prophetic word. We don't just have a fleeting moment, just one experience. We have everything that God ever wanted us to have. And I believe that God knows that we are people who, we need consistency. We need something that we can go back to. You know, we all have experiences in our life that, that have shaped us and changed who we are. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it's just what that is. It's just an experience. You remember it for a while, and then it's gone. God wanted to give us something so sure that we can never move past it. That no matter what we're going through, that we don't have to rely on the experience, that we can go back to his very word. And so Peter's saying, even more than the mountaintop experience, we have God's word. So God wants to shout from the mountain to you every single day. And he does, and he can. We have the opportunity to hear from him every single day. Not just once in a lifetime. You know, what an opportunity. What a gift that the most powerful thing in the world is in our hands. It's even on our phones. You know, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16... If you'll flip back there with me. You know, he's telling Timothy, his child in the faith, that Scripture has no limits. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, and so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You know, everything that we need is here in God's word. Everything that Salem Baptist Church needs is in God's word. Everything that you come across in your life that you need, it's found in the pages of scripture. You know, every situation that you face, whether at work, at school, at home, 
any situation this church will face, anything that pops up on the farm, on the ranch, we can find the answer in God's word. We are not alone. God did not leave us to just go through life blind. So he's given us his word as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. You know, we don't have to wonder what God's will for Salem Baptist Church is. We don't have to think, well, I hope Brad knows what he's doing because, you know, we don't know what we're supposed to do as a church. And if your hope is in me, you know, there's not a whole lot of hope, you know. But thankfully, God has given us this, that we can we have a sure foundation. And one of probably the most difficult question anyone ever has to answer is, you know, what is God's will for my life? You know, what do I do as an individual? And we don't have to wonder about that either. God has clearly told us what his will for you as an individual is, and he's clearly told you what his will for our church is. You know, we just have to, to be patient, to look at it, to find it, and then to do what he tells us to do. But, you know, sadly, not everybody recognizes the Bible for what it is. Not everybody is like the Thessalonians, that when they hear the message from God, they recognize it as God's word. You know, so this morning we're going to look at four challenges that, that are thrown in the face of Scripture. You know, and that we have to make a choice. Are we going to believe what somebody else says, what somebody else is doing? Or are we going to take a stand and believe what the Bible says? And so the first challenge that we face is that many times our own culture and the Bible disagree. You know, so what do we do as believers when things in our culture disagree with the Bible. You know, God doesn't want us to have to wonder, so look with me at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. picks up in the middle of a sentence, but verse 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. We kind of hinted at this idea this morning in the prayer time before Sunday school, but uh, as we think about life passing, that there is for us as believers, there's a place that this isn't our eternal home, that there is a place in heaven that God is preparing for us for all eternity. And Paul's reminding the Philippian church, like, this isn't your home. This isn't where God intends you to stay forever. Your true citizenship is in heaven. You know, this week, Crystal and I, we've been trying to get become residents of Texas. You know, I was able to get our license plate changed. I traded in my Tennessee license plate for Texas license plates, and they gave me four, and I'm like, I've only got two cars. I'm like, well, put one in the back and one in the front. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and so, I uh, still don't have a, a driver's license yet. we got to work on that. But uh, we're trying to become a resident of Texas. And even still, we're, you know, no matter where you live, what state you live, we're a resident, a citizen of the United States. And we have rules that we have to follow. We have things that we have to obey. The state by state, things may be a little different, but altogether we have earthly authorities that we have to follow in line, or there's penalties. But Paul is saying, above all of that, your citizenship, your true citizenship is in heaven. You know, so above everything else, no matter what Texas says, no matter what America says, no matter what any other state says, you need to listen above all to what God says. Because he's the one who can save you. He's the one who's preparing a home by his own power for you. And so, But there are things in our culture that disagree with the Bible. <clears throat> you know, when we think about, you know, just the current issue, one very visible example of this is just the definition of marriage. You know, our culture is trying to redefine, and in many ways has tried, in their minds, they have redefined what marriage is. You know, they want to make it to suit what they want. But God told us what marriage was. He clearly defined it in the first very pages of Scripture. He said that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he created woman. 
And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, so, but there are things that come up from our culture, from our society, that are going to be opposed to what God has said in his word. And so when these things happen, we have the choice. Are we going to go along with the culture? Or are we going to stand strong on God's word? You know, G.K. Chesterton said that a dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. And my prayer is that Salem Baptist Church will be a living and active force in the community and the culture of Big Spring, Texas. That we will love people, that we will point people to Jesus Christ. And that when things come along that don't line up with what God has said in his word, I pray that we will be strong enough to take a stand. And that we won't just be like a dead thing floating along with the stream. I pray that we will be strong and active. And that we can take a stand on God's word and swim upstream and make a difference. That we won't be swept away by every wind of doctrine, by every human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. But we have the choice to make. When things arise in our culture that disagree with God's word, what will we do? Another challenge we face is that there are times when the Bible and our earthly authorities disagree. You know, much like our culture, uh, culture is a little bit more ambiguous. You know, there's, um, and it changes often. Um, but what about our earthly authorities? What about our rules and our laws? Um, again, God doesn't want us, he doesn't leave us hanging. He wants us to know exactly what to do in those situations. And so turn with me to Acts chapter 4. There's two very similar stories in Acts 4 and 5, and they both deal with this, this issue. And so we're going to quickly read in verse, verses 5 through 20, just so you kind of have the background of what's going on. And so, well, and so Peter and John, they were going into Jerusalem, and they saw a man who was crippled, who was lame from birth, and he's ask, he's begging, he's saying, you know, do you have any money? Peter's John said, we don't have any silver or gold, but what we do give you comes from Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And this man's been crippled from birth. And so he does, by, by God's grace and God's power, he stands up and he walks. And so now the whole city is just, because they know this is the crippled beggar that always sits here, he's always begging, and now he's jumping up, he's dancing around, and he's healed. Like, how in the world did this happen? So we pick up in verse 5. So it says, The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. And after they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them, and they ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But look at how they respond in verse 19 and 20. Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. You know, Peter and John, they say, you know, it doesn't matter what you decide is right. But we can't stop talking about what we've seen God do. We can't stop talking about what God has done in our own life. You know, if you want to make a law, if you want to tell us to quit talking about it, you know, that's physically impossible for us. We can't stop talking about who Jesus is and what he's done. You know, thankfully in America, we're not really faced with that type of ultimatum. You know, but should it ever come, I pray that we have the boldness and the power of the Spirit to respond in the same way. And over in Acts chapter 5, there's a very similar story. You know, the apostles, they're arrested for preaching and teaching. They're put in prison. But God sends an angel to them in the night to, to free them. And so the next day, what are they doing? Well, they're back in the city. They go back to the temple. And they're preaching about Jesus all over again. So the high priest finds out that somehow they've gotten out of prison and that they're teaching again. So let's look at 527. It says, After they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, Didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So Paul's very, or Peter's very clear. He's like, we have to obey God more than people. Now, we're going to follow your rules as long as they don't conflict with what God has told us. But when the day comes when, when your earthly rules tell us to do one thing and God and his word is telling us to do another, we have to obey God. And so my prayer for Salem Baptist Church is that, just like they said, that, that, that we will fill the streets and the communities of Big Spring, Texas with the teachings of Jesus. You know, may we ha always have the strength and the boldness to obey God over men when they disagree. Another challenge that arises against the authority of the Bible is tradition. And tradition is more of a tricky one in the sense that it's not... It's not always as clear-cut. It's not always as easy to identify. You know, tradition was meant to be a guardrail to the faith. You know, traditions were put in place to keep us safe, to keep us from going into heresy, to keep us fall to, from falling away from the truth. But at different times throughout church history, tradition has ended up taking a more prominent role than even Scripture itself. You know, historically, we usually think of the Middle Ages, you know, when the Catholic Church began to, to put more authority and more power into the hands of the Pope and the priests and the office of the Church than Scripture ever intended. And what resulted was that the office of the pastor became more powerful than even God's Word. But thankfully, through the Reformation, everything kind of got back on track. The Reformers said, no, we have to obey Scripture first. It's the most important foundation we have. But it wasn't an easy process. It came through sacrifice. You know, but, and we're not in the Middle Ages today, but that doesn't mean that we still don't have to be on guard against tradition trying to creep in and take a more prominent role. You know, we have different denominations. We have different religions today. And many times we can get so distorted on what the actual purpose of the church is that we lose sight of what we're actually supposed to be doing. And this isn't something that just popped up in the Middle Ages either. We see it in the very pages of Scripture. 
Look with me at Galatians chapter 2. We'll read verses 11 through 15. Here Paul is he's telling the Galatians of a time when he actually had to confront Peter because Peter was allowing a tradition of men to overrule what God had told Peter earlier. So let's look at what Paul says in Galatians 2.11. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, If you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? So what's going on here, if you remember back in Acts chapter 10, you know, Peter had a pretty significant vision from God. You know, he was on a roof, he was asleep, and in this vision, God was letting down all these different types of animals on a sheet. And the voice from heaven comes and says, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. Peter's like, God, I'm not going to eat these. These are Some of these things are unclean. I've never eaten an unclean animal. I'm a good Jew. I don't eat some of this stuff. And God's like, don't call what I have made unclean. <clears throat> Peter's thinking God is just referring to food. He's thinking, well, okay, I guess now we can eat whatever we want. But God has a more important message for Peter. He sh he's revealing to him, and he later reveals to him that it, God's not concerned with food. He's concerned with people. The, God, this is God's way of showing Peter that the message of Jesus, the gospel, isn't just for the Jews, but it's for all people. It's for Gentiles as well. And in the very next scenario, Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, is coming. He's trying to find out the good news about Jesus. And God sends Peter. He tells Cornelius. Cornelius believes. He, the Holy Spirit comes on him, and then word spreads back to the Jews in Jerusalem that now God's Holy Spirit is coming on Gentiles when they believe just like it is us. And so from then on, Peter begins not only preaching to the Jews, but he's preaching to the Gentiles. He's preaching to everybody. But the problem comes, so which Paul finds out that okay, Peter's been hanging out with Gentiles. He's been eating with them. But then there's this circumcision party of Jews who are trying to take all the rules of the Old Testament that they've been trying to follow unsuccessfully, and they're trying to make the Gentile believers follow. So when Peter, when these people come to visit, Peter's a little afraid, he steps back, he quits hanging out with the Gentiles, and Paul's like, you can't do this. You were doing what God had told you to do, but now you're pulling back because of what these men think. Don't worry about what people think. Don't worry about what tradition says. You do what God has told you to do. And so if it can happen to Peter, it can happen to any one of us. You know, we have to be on guard to make sure that we don't let anything, no matter how seemingly powerful, come between us and being fully obedient to God's word. You know, don't let a tradition keep you from doing it. So as Salem Baptist Church, we have to make sure that everything that we do is in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the last challenge we're going to look at today, again, this one's not as relevant right now, but I fear it may be more so in the future. And that is, what do we do when being obedient to God's word brings difficulty and persecution? You know, in America, persecution is not something that we have to go around being fearful about. But our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world don't live in the same reality. You know, when we were in India, we knew uh, for someone to put their faith in Jesus, and especially when they were baptized, it was an assumption that they would be persecuted. It wasn't always physical, but some type of persecution was going to come. It usually wasn't life-threatening. 
the crystalline I know of Indian pastors who ended up giving their lives because they were preaching the gospel. That they, I know one man who was killed on Christmas because he preached a service on Christmas Eve. And so it's just a reality that, that many people in the world face that if they're going to be obedient to Jesus, sometimes persecution and difficulty comes. And let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Right before, we, were, we already read verse 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God, but look back to verse 12. It says, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I mean, that's a promise. Paul's telling Timothy, if you want to live a godly life, if you want to do what God is calling you to do, don't think that it's going to be easy. There will be times of difficulty. There will be persecution. Now, again, persecution, it's a big spectrum. It doesn't mean that we're all going to be martyrs. But Scripture is very clear. If we're going to try to live holy lives, if we're going to do what God has called us to do, the road isn't always easy. You know, so in these moments when, when things come up, when when we have a choice, you know, what will we do? You know, it's often easier to take the easy route and to give up on our faith or maybe not just completely abandon the faith, but just go along with whatever the situation is so that it kind of gets us out of trouble and tomorrow we'll get back on track. Or will we stand strong? Will we be the force that's able to stand in the stream and go upstream? knowing that in the end it will pay off. You know, it's, a, it's interesting that this verse comes right before verse 316 that we already read where Paul is telling Timothy just how useful and important God's word is. You know, the key to remaining strong when things aren't going the way we like isn't to give up, but it's to go back to the thing that lasts forever. God has given us his word so that when hard times come, we don't have to wonder. We don't have to face it alone. We can go back and we can be reminded of all the promises that he's already given us. We can be reminded of all the blessings that he's already blessed us with. And it will give us grace and strength to, to carry on. You know, there's nothing more powerful in this universe than God's word. There's nothing that we should place above it in our lives. And so as we begin this new year together, the year 2020, I want you to know that anything that I try to lead you in as your pastor, it should be founded in Scripture. If I ever try to do anything that's not founded in Scripture, you need to call me out on it. You know, And in the same way, as a church, we should be, this has to be the foundation of everything that we do. Not just for me as your pastor, but for you as individuals as well. So this past Wednesday, January 1st, I started a new reading plan. Uh, for 2020, and it's, it'll take me through the entire Bible in one year. I, I generally like to read through the Bible every year. And so, but I, I challenge you to find a systematic way to study God's Word. You know, if you read four chapters a day, it will take you through the entire Bible in a year. But even if you want to go a little bit deeper, I know sometimes it's hard to, when you're reading that much at a time, you feel like you're just kind of skimming the surface. So at times, there's times when you want to go deeper and just focus on maybe a chapter or even less. And that's okay, too. But just find a systematic plan. You know, on our phones, there's an app called YouVersion or the Bible app. It's got thousands of different plans. Some of them are five days. Some of them are 365 days. And so it's just some of them have devotionals with them. Some of them, it's just, you know, a chapter or a verse or a section of Scripture to read. So there's all kinds of tools available. Many Bibles themselves have like a, in the very back, have a reading plan. You know, but I challenge you this year, if you're going to make a resolution, make a resolution that's not going to fail you. Make one that, that's going to stand with you forever. You know, the most important thing in our life and the most powerful thing in our life is Scripture. You know, it's what Paul wanted to leave Timothy said so all scripture is inspired or it's breathed out by God. 
and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. And I pray that this year you will allow Scripture to do what only it can. Allow it to equip you for every good work. Let's pray.